So, although we're about to enter our 10th year as an organization at Groundswell Center, um, it's really in recent years with the commitment of our staff and leadership that we've been digging deep into how to center our programs and services around social justice. And so as part of this commitment, after reading Leah Penniman's article in Yes Magazine titled Four Not So Easy Ways to Dismantle Racism in the Food System, and having heard so many powerful things about Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York, the Groundswell staff decided to invite local partners and took a field trip to Soul Fire Farm in 2016 for one of their community work days. It was a really beautiful day. It was filled with cleaning garlic, planting trees, terracing slopes, making kraut, and connecting with many food justice activists who came to spend the day supporting Soul Fire's work. Leah herself was incredibly warm, welcoming, and so generous with her abundant knowledge of sustainable farming practices and how to merge them with a just, equitable food system that confronts, as she calls it, food apartheid. Her thinking, her writing, and her work have kept us returning to Soul Fire for their uprooting racism in the food system trainings and community work days, where we are constantly inspired to dig even deeper into what a truly equitable food system looks like in the Finger Lakes region and how we can contribute to it. Leah herself wears many, many hats as an educator, farmer, writer, and food justice activist. She co-founded Soul Fire Farm in 2011 with the mission to end racism in the food system and reclaim ancestral connection to land. Leah is a part of a team that facilitates powerful food sovereignty programs, including farmer trainings for black and brown people, a subsidized farm food distribution program for people living under food apartheid, and domestic and international organizing toward equity in the food system. Leah holds a master's in science education and a bachelor's in environmental science and international development from Clark University. She has been farming since 1996 and teaching since 2002. The work of Leah and Soul Fire Farm have been recognized by the Soros Racial Justice Fellowship, Fulbright Program, Presidential Award for Science Teaching, New York State Health Emerging Innovator Awards, and the Andrew Goodman Foundation, among others. We are so grateful to have her here in Ithaca to learn from. Without further ado, Leah Penniman. <laughs> You know, I'm a salad too. You all are the main course, so I can't do the work for you. Um, can we all just take a deep breath? There is so much power in this room. So much power in this room. I mean, we have those beautiful babies up here dancing and showing us why and how black lives matter and about Umoja and Kujijagulia. We have the incredible, wise Sachem Sam George reminding us of the sacred earth beneath our feet and all these dope ass community organized, sorry, organizations, I shouldn't curse on say there's babies in here, but you're like reclaiming food and educating the youth. This is, this is my first time in Cayuga lands and Cayuga country, and it's really uh, such an honor to be here amongst visionaries, power, power, powerful visionaries like y'all. So thank you for having me. Um, we're gonna do some storytelling. If I can make this thing work. Anyway, while we're working that out, um, later on in the presentation, we're gonna need each of you to have one of these quotes. So I'm gonna hand this to my friend Raph and just make sure it makes its way all the way around. So in Haiti, where my mother is from, when it's time to tell a story, there's a call and response. Does anyone know, anyone Haitian in the house? Sac passe? No? Okay, so when I say crick, you say crack, which means you wanna hear the story. Crick? Crack. Crick? All right, so we're gonna start with the ancestors. We are gonna start um, with my grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd. She was one of the 12.5 million black people who were kidnapped from the shores of West Africa. She was kidnapped in the late 1700s for her agricultural knowledge, just like so many of our ancestors were. You know, our people, white people didn't know how to grow rice. They didn't know how to do subtropical agri agriculture. So they captured our ancestors, right? 
and brought them over to do that, that unpaid work. But what's so amazing about my grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd, and the other women in the community is they didn't know what was gonna happen next. And yet they took their okra and their millet and their sorghum and their rice seed and they braided it into their hair, believing against odds in a future on soil, right? And times right now, hi, Speedy, times right now are rough, but if our ancestors didn't give up on us in those conditions, we sure as hell can't give up on our descendants, right? Thank you. So I'm gonna invite you all to think of an ancestor who sacrificed for you. Hold their name in your consciousness, and when I count to three, say it loud and proud. One, two, three. Ashe, thank you. How are we doing with the slideshow? You're just gonna do that? Okay, cool. So Marcus Garvey wisely said that if we don't know where we came from, then we don't actually know who we are. So I'm gonna put forth a hypothesis that the entire food system is rooted in racism. It has been in this country since its inception and continues to be in an unbroken chain. So we're gonna explore that history. Uh, we're gonna explore where, how we fit into that history and then what Soul Fire Farm and some of the other folks in the movement are doing about it. Because like I said, we all need to braid the seeds in our hair, right? We are all the main course. So we'll start here. Does anyone know what this picture represents? Yes, what is Manifest Destiny? Yes, it's a devastating genocidal concept, Manifest Destiny, um, that you could actually argue started in the 1400s with the Catholic Church deeming people of color and non-Christians as non-human beings and given a papal decree to say, colonize, enslave, and pilfer the heathen nations, as they were called, right? And that became the justification for the genocide of millions of people on this continent and the theft of all of the land. And we can't forget that, that the land itself is stolen. It was never paid for. Reparations were never made for that land. Can we working it out now? Thank you. So stolen land became the basis of the food system, but then also stolen labor, right? Twelve and a half million black people captured for their agricultural knowledge, put in the bowels of slave ships and brought and the slave trade lasted for, for hundreds of years. And for a while, you know, even after the slave trade itself was outlawed, in the United States, we had what was called the internal slave trade, right? Because with the invention of the cotton gin and the expansion of the, that industry in the North, there was a huge demand. And so the Deep South opened up. And almost a half of black families were torn apart in the internal slave trade. I just found this uh, quotation from one freed person whose testimony was recorded, he said, I had a constant dread that Mrs. Moore, her mistress, would be in want of money and sell my dear wife. We constantly dreaded a final separation. Our affection for each other was very strong, and this made us always apprehensive of a cruel parting. And I read that because, you know, I talk about these statistics a lot, and sometimes it's, it's easy to forget um, that black lives matter, you know, that we're people and that we love each other, we love our families, and to be torn apart in itself is egregious. And then also to build the whole wealth of this nation and to never be paid is egregious. And sometimes we imagine, you know, it ended with that. It ended in 1865. What happened in 1865? 13th Amendment, An Emancipation Proclamation. And for anyone who's seen the movie 13th, um, which is a beautiful, beautiful movie, you know that slavery actually didn't end then. It just took a different form. So if you read the 13th Amendment, and I'm not exaggerating, right, it literally says that slavery is outlawed except in the case when a person's been convicted of a crime. So what they did immediately after that to save the South was to criminalize blackness. Vagrancy became a crime. That means not having a job. Loitering became a crime. That means hanging around, not taking off your hat, 
not going to church or going to the wrong church, being in a group of three or more at a train station because you were trying to get out of there, those became crimes and the prisons filled with black people. Anyone guess what time of year most black people were rounded up? Harvest time. Interesting. So what the states did is they leased out black people back to their former so-called masters and to the mines and to the railroads. The death rate was 25% under convict leasing. It was higher than under slavery times. And the folks who weren't in prison were in a debt peonage system called sharecropping or tenant farming. And that's basically a system where you don't own your lands, right? You're renting your lands, but then you owe the person a, a portion of your crop. Um, the scales weren't fair, right? There was stealing going on from the people, so you'd be in perpetual debt. And if you break your contract, that's also a crime, so then you go to prison. Despite that, despite that, my ancestors worked on Sundays and saved their Sunday money and bought 16 million acres of their own land, because that's what freedom meant, right? But people got scared about that. White supremacists got scared about people owning their own land. And so we had the rise between 1880 and 1950. 4,000 black people were lynched in the South, but most of them right around 1910. And the reason was that black people were starting to own their own land and their own farms. And that was undermining white supremacy. And so they quite literally targeted black landowners with lynchings and with cross burnings. I found another um, quote of one particular incident of land theft that I thought was really powerful. They said, After midnight on October 4th, 1908, 50 hooded white men surrounded the home of a black farmer in Hinkman, Kentucky, and ordered him to come out for a whipping. When David Walker refused and shot at them instead, the mob poured coal oil on his house and set it afire, according to contemporary newspaper accounts. Pleading for mercy, Walker ran out the front door, followed by four screaming children and a wife carrying a baby in her arms. The mob shot them all, wounding three children and killing the others. Walker's oldest son never escaped the burning house. No one was ever charged with the killings and the surviving children were deprived of the farm their father died defending. Land records show that Walker's farm was simply folded into the property of a white neighbor. The neighbor sold it to another white man whose daughter owns the undeveloped land today in 2018. This was one of 24,000 accounts of land theft that were recently documented. It was a terrorism campaign. So stolen land and stolen labor and white supremacy are the very DNA of our food system. Black people got the hell out of there as soon as they could, right? Came to the north, great migration, six million folks. It was the largest internal migration aside from the forced migration of indigenous people um, in the history of this nation. And Around the time of the Great Migration, there was a progressive swell, progressive consciousness in the nation, right? 1935, we had the New Deal. For the first time, we had labor laws. We had the Federal Labor Relations Act. Um, we had Social Security. And at first, the vision for this was really noble. Like, this could have been a turning point because FDR wanted everyone included, all y'all all the shades included in this package. But the Southern senators wouldn't vote for it if everybody was included. And so they changed the law, and now you can FOIA it because you can do freedom of information and see this because it's old enough history. They literally had these closed door discussions where they said, well, we can't technically say that black people can't get social security or have minimum wage, but we can say that agricultural workers and domestic workers will not have those rights. So that's what they did. And those laws, Social Security, we got a generation later. That's a whole generation of wealth lost. But if you still look at the Federal Labor Relations Act and the other protections, there are exclusions for agricultural and domestic workers. Do you ever wonder why farmers get paid less? Don't have the right to unionize? Don't have overtime pay? Why you can be 12 years old and you don't have to go to school if you're a farm worker, but you can work at sub-minimum wage? 
It's because in the 1930s there was a deliberate racist policy that still hasn't been rectified. And it's led to the perpetual exploitation of farm workers. Right? As the Great Migration passed and the sharecroppers and tenant farmers were leaving their farms, there was a labor void. And the United States, rather than saying, oh, now is the time, right? Now is the time to rectify this history of injustice, they said, well, who else can we exploit? Right? We've exploited our entire domestic population. So why don't we start looking at the Philippines, at China, at Mexico, at Jamaica, at Haiti? Does anyone know what program started in the 1940s? Bracero program, the guest worker program, right? Today it's called the H-2A program. And granted, there are some farmers who are part of that, who do right by their workers, but it's very, very easy to exploit people under an H-2A visa because they are contracted to a particular farm. And if they breach that contract, they're deported. And when your whole life and all of your investment is tied up into getting to this country to get wages, to pay for your family's expenses, Taking a risk to support, to report sexual violence or wage theft is not a risk that many people are willing to take. Even as recently as 1998, the Immaculate Workers uncovered literal slavery rings amongst farm workers in Florida. Not metaphorical slavery, not neo-slavery, but people chained against their will and forced to work on farms in 1998. Where it's not done, the racism in the food system hasn't finished. And at the same time, what we were dealing with, thank you, I don't know if you could put that on, um, in the black community was further theft of our land. So Dr. King actually summarizes this better than me, so we'll just listen to what he has to say. It should be on Internet Explorer if you want to. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. So what Dr. King is talking about, right, is the Morrill Act, the Homestead Act, that essentially was a mechanism for stealing First Nations land and transferring it to white settlers, and then providing universities for those settlers to learn how to farm. The USDA was discriminating against black farmers by denying credits denying relief programs and technical assistance that was required for them to give by law. And one of the reasons it could work that way is because the USDA works through these county committees where people get elected onto them. And it was a long time before any black person was elected onto those county committees. So actually, I just got back from Georgia where the 100 farmers who led the Pigford v. Glickman lawsuit against the USDA, who were all in their 80s now, were gathering to figure out what to do now that they had won the largest civil rights settlement, proving that the USDA had discriminated against them and was the number one driver of black land loss. It was a very, very powerful gathering and also tragic because these farmers are, are aging out, right? And then, you know, our people went to the urban areas, many of us, um, seeking better opportunities, but land theft was happening here too. The number one way that Americans build wealth is through home ownership, right? But the federal government had different ideas for black people, and their idea for black people was something called redlining, where essentially they paid to have neighborhoods categorized from best to worst, and the worst neighborhoods were considered neighborhoods with people of color. And I was literally just on Zillow a couple weeks ago, and they still use the red coloring around black neighborhoods. Today, this is supposed to be done. 
But what happened is that lenders would not provide mortgages for these communities. And when folks got back from the war and the GI Bill, less than 100 of tens of thousands of those homes went to black people because you literally could not get a home in your community. You had to be a renter, which meant that when, you know, all of the 1980s urban renewal, you didn't actually have the security of your own home, right? Now we're dealing with gentrification, so it's not over. That was a very brief version of the way that I think that racism is baked into the food system. And I want you to take a moment right now and just talk to the person next to you or the peoples next to you. Where are your people in this story? Where did you recognize an ancestor, someone in your lineage? I'll give you like three minutes and we'll come back. All right, lovely people. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. <laughs> when I say free the people, you say free the land. Free the people. Free the people. Free the so thank you for doing that. I would ask you to share out, but I really want to make sure folks like get home at eight, so I'm going to roll a little bit um, with that. But I want to say that it is so, so, so important to situate ourselves in the history because it's not about blame or shame. It's not about excusing your ancestors, none of that stuff. It is about acknowledging truth and being able to move forward from that place. And there's just as much courage, right, in acknowledging the complicity as there is in acknowledging the oppression or the victimhood. Like all of that really, really matters. Um, and people are complex, right? Our ancestors simultaneously loved and worked hard and contributed to their communities, and then maybe also committed atrocities. And we get to really sit with that contradiction, um, which is in all of us, in all of us. Nobody is a perfectly good or perfectly bad human being, right? Um, but just to really ground it, where we are today right now is still on top of that legacy, right? It's, in terms of food access, we still have one in three black children going hungry in this country, and one in six white children, which is not excusable either. We have food apartheid. That's a situation where depending on where you're born, you may be more likely to get diabetes, heart disease, obesity, cancer, ADHD, and other diet-related illnesses just because of your zip code, right? We have the situation still where farm workers today are paid less than any other sector, where we don't have adequate protections from pesticides and work-related injuries and do not have the right to collectively bargain or a fair wage. We still have the situation where almost all the land, depending how you count it, between 95 and 98 percent of the land is owned by European heritage people today. That is the whitest land ownership we've had since 1865. Think about that. It's getting worse. It's getting worse every census. We still have a situation where the same white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal beast is incarcerating our people and starving our people. These are the same neighborhoods that have higher incarceration that also have high food insecurity. Right? And we still have the situation where even though most of the world, 70% of the world's food is still grown using sustainable indigenous practices that have been able to feed our people without destroying the earth for tens of thousands of years, right? that we are moving towards an industrial agriculture system that is the number one driver of climate change, the number one driver of water withdrawals, and the number one driver of land loss and extinction. This is where our food system is at today. And I know that I can't solve it all, and you can't solve it all, and you can't, right? We're going to have to really, really put it together. But at the same time, none of us can be complicit. None of us can actually just sit back and say, well, it's too big of a problem. And for us at Soulfire, the question really was like, what is that thing that the world needs that also is what our heart most deeply desires to give? And it was about freedom through self-determination and food. It was really about that for us. So what we tried to do at Soulfire um, 
is to figure out how, how we could use the piece of land that we're so privileged to steward. It's Mohican lands, and we're a black and brown community. That's not Mohican, so we're privileged to steward that land. And to have it be like a ground zero for food sovereignty. We feed people, we do education work, uh, we do organizing work. And my elders in Ghana, who are the ones who initiated me, my spiritual teachers, they have a beautiful uh, proverb. It says, latte ete no no da. Can you say that? Latte ete no no da. If there are three stones, the cooking pot will stand firm. So they say, whenever you try to think about the work you're doing, think about what are those three pillars. And so I'm gonna tell you what our three pillars were, how we came up with them. So the first thing that we're trying to do is just Feed the people, feed the soil, right? Very, very simple, very basic, but you can't be a farm without focusing on that. And so we created our Ujama. Who does anyone remember what Ujama means? <coughs> Cooperative economics, smart money, right? We create our Ujama farm share. And the idea with Ujama farm share is we don't want to exploit you as the consumer, right? And you're not trying to exploit us as the, as the producer. We're actually in family, in relationship. And so we charge whatever people can afford and bring food right to people's doorsteps in neighborhoods under food apartheid every week from June until November. We accept EBT. And for folks who are refugees, immigrants, or people who have a family member who's incarcerated, the food is absolutely free. And we don't rely on grants to pay for that food because we're trying to demonstrate a model of an sustain economically sustainable farm. So community members pay more, whatever they can afford for their share, to subsidize the shares of those who can't afford. We call it Feed Your Neighbor, we call it Solidarity Shares, we call it Netflix for Vegetables, whatever you want to call it. The end result is that people are getting food that they otherwise would not be able to get. People are telling me that you know, their children like open the box and are so excited to pull out all the different melons and the colors and things that they could never afford. Because there is, you know, on the corner store, you can get hot Cheetos and tacos with your $3 or maybe a box of pasta, but you're not going to be able to get these like heirloom melons. And we have these tomatoes that grow these like funny little things that look like penises. And there's like a lot of amazing stuff in that box. But we didn't, we didn't come up with this idea, right, of feeding your community. Who thought of it? or one of the people that thought of it, right? The Black Panthers, right? So this is a free breakfast program that was going on that the entire United States has modeled our free breakfast and lunch programs after. The Black Panthers' so-called terrorist organization, primary work was survival programs. They provided clinics, food, transportation, you know, to their community, education, they even ran a school for their community. And so this was our, these are the ancestors that we are standing on, the shoulders of. And of course we're doing this in a way that doesn't trash the planet. We're doing this in a way that um, sequesters carbon instead of lets it off into the air using no-till, using cover cropping, using heritage varieties. And something that you know, we're, we're getting more into is like just reclaiming our relationship to the cow pea and reclaiming our relationship to sorghum and to okra and all of these crops that came from the continents, right, and that often aren't credited sesame. But another thing my elders in Ghana taught me is they were like, you know why nothing ever grows right in the United States? They were like, because people think they just put a seed in there and they don't even pray over it and they don't even dance and they don't even say nothing like it's a dead thing, the seed or the soil. They thought we were crazy. And so we, I was like, oh yeah, I was doing that. Um, so now we learn from our elders that actually the seed and the soil are live living beings in relationship and community with us. And so you have to bless and thank the seed. And so this is, a, every week we have a little dance party in the field and you know, thank the, the plants. But we didn't come up with all these ideas of sustainable agriculture, right? Obviously this goes back tens of thousands of years. But even very recently, who are these, these people? Carver and Watley, right? Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. This is, Carver is one of the first people to write down organic agriculture techniques in this country. He called it regenerative agriculture. He said, that monocropping with the cotton and the tobacco is destroying the soil. What you need to do is you need to rotate some leguminous cover crops in there. You need diversified horticulture, a lot of different types of crops. You need windbreaks. He, there's, I, read, I actually read his, some of his memoirs, and he was, basically got all the farmers in the fall to go to the swamps with their, their, wag, their mules and their wagons and muck out the swamps and bring back that stuff and compost it and put it on the land, right? It's like, 
People trying to act like permaculture is a new thing. This is old stuff. Watley came up with pick your own. He's like, I've got this great idea. We're going to get city folks to pay us to do the harvest. It's going to work out great. <laughs> He was a genius. He's like, people are getting disconnected from the land. We can't afford it. So he, and he came up with the CSA idea. And I mean, just really, really brilliant. He calls it the clientele membership club. So our ancestors have been in it. So don't let them lie to you and tell you it's a white people thing, right? Our buildings too, we build out of straw and adobe and wood and try to leave most of the land for the animals, right? So that's our first stone, just our survival programs. Our second stone, latte ete no no da, right? Is our training programs because each one teach one, right? So we have the Black Latinx Farmers Immersion is like number one. We got some offshoots, we got a Builders Immersion, we got some different things going on. But the idea with this is basically about reclaiming our ancestral right to belong to the land and to have agency in the food system. Hundreds of people have gone through the program. We're like a family, almost everyone is farming, almost everyone is doing food justice leadership. People are just so amazing in this program. Um, and this was very much inspired by some of the work of the Sherrods, um, Shirley Sherrod, who I got to hang out with last weekend, who started the New Communities Land Trust, Fannie Lou Hamer, who started the Freedom Farm Cooperative, the Farmers Alliance, all of these groups were doing each one teach one. They were owning land in common, they were holding educational programs, they were feeding their communities, right? And so we're trying to learn from this legacy. I mean, the first land trust in the United States was black. They didn't teach you that in school, they didn't teach you that, right? This is my favorite graduate, Keisha Cameron. Does anyone want to read what she had to say? I'll give you the mic. I was depleted and discouraged, not sure if my vision of community farming was sustainable for me and my family. BLFI's embrace not only grounded me, but renewed my dreams and helped inspire our newly designed Mbutu community farm program. So what I love about this is like a lot of funders and stuff will be like, why don't you just spread like your empire of soul fire and franchise? And I think that's totally crazy and capitalist. I'm like, I don't need to decide what other communities need. But when someone like Keisha comes almost ready to quit farming because it's really hard, y'all know how hard it is, and comes and gets reinvigorated and gets some new tools and got this idea for a training program on her own farm in Georgia that reinvigorated it, brought in some income, like that's it. That sort of translocal people to people support and organizing. So that's really our vision. It's like mycelium. We're just going to stop popping up everywhere with our mushrooms, right? Um, but something I learned that, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't realize was necessary at first is, like, people would come to learn about cation exchange capacity, and then they would leave getting off of drugs or alcohol or being less depressed, right? And there was a way, thank you, there was a way that I didn't at first understand how much, like, the exile from the land all of those lynchings and burnings and for forced migration and enslavement, how deeply that trauma went. And now with epigenetics, we actually understand that trauma is inherited and that healing is inherited. It's not just imaginary. But the land has been missing us. She has been craving us. She's been trying to soak that wisdom back up through our feet and remind us who we are. And there's something that happens every time at BLFI, this like magic of reconnection that allows all kinds of other possibilities to open up, right? So I gave all of you a little piece of paper. Some of them are quotes from um, participants. Some of them are quotes from other people who care about this work. But I'm going to ask you to just take a moment with the person next to you again, share what your quote says, what you think that person was trying to get across, and if it touches you in any way, you know, what is that? And if you didn't get a paper because we ran out, just find someone with a paper and share. So three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people, free the people. All right. So I like to believe that whatever quote you got was like meant to be so you can take it home and have it. <laughs> but of course, this idea of healing as part of liberation is also not new, right? So I want to shout out Harriet Tubman. Right? Because a lot of people don't realize that when she was the conductor for the Underground Railroad, in which she never lost a passenger, 
One of her strategies was spiritual and herbal healing. Can you imagine the terror? Can you imagine the dogs, the fear, the crying baby that might give away your hiding place? She was a minister, right? She, she got people down on their knees praying and singing quietly, humming. She found the herbs from the forest that helped quell anxiety and make babies sleep. She was a healer. So healing and liberation is not new either. And of course, we got our babies involved too when we talk about each one, teach one. We've worked with well over 1,600 youth in uh, various programs. And of course, they learn to cook and they climb on the trapeze and they learn to, you know, uh, do some farming. And, but more than that, I think for the young people who so often are only told that their destiny is incarceration or early death, to actually be in a space where you can imagine a life that's about being productive member of your community, about being valued and seen, is what's most profound. And it's little things like we can make a bouquet that we could give to our teacher or our mother. It's like we have something to offer you. We're real, we exist. There's this one young man, Kareem, that's a pseudonym because he doesn't want me to say his real name. Um, he's a friend of mine now. He's grown. But he came when he was 13-year-old to the program, and he was one of the young people who was in our alternative to incarceration. So youth can choose to do like a 50-hour training program and get their records wiped clean. It's complicated, but it's one of the ways that we're trying to interrupt school-to-prison pipeline. But he came like with his hood up and earbuds in, and he was not trying to interact with nobody. And I'm, you know, sort of earthy. So I'm like, everyone grab an object from nature and bring it to the circle and we're gonna share. And he didn't wanna do that, which is fine. Um, but then it was time to go on this tour and on the tour it's muddy and he had new sneakers and he wasn't trying to get his sneakers messed up. So I was like, you can either take your shoes off or you can wear your sneakers or we can leave you here because we're all going to the other field. And he was afraid of the woods. So he's like, I'm coming and I'm taking my shoes off. And this young man, this amazing young man, when he got back at the end and we were sharing, he said, that was the first time he ever put his bare foot on the earth, and he said when he did, a memory of his grandmother who had passed away just came flooding up through the soles of his feet up to his heart. And he's like, when I, she made me do this stuff. When I was little, she made me hold worms in the garden and, you know, and told me they were good and that taught me that I could pick the strawberries and all, and I had forgotten about that. I forgot that this had anything to do with me, but now I remember this has something to do with me. Um, and he asked if he could like make a movie about his grandma. So we're like, of course. And then the other kids start crying, like, I'll make a movie about my grandma too. <laughs> healing, healing, right? Um, this is the Victory Bus Project, which we also work on. That is, this is Jalal, he's dope. But um, this is a Black Panther inspired program where we provide transportation to people from New York City to upstate New York prisons and then also food packages to those same people. Uh, because right now, as you probably know, the rural economy in New York, the farming economy is being replaced by a prison economy. So it's, it's, hurting, it's hurting folks on both sides. Uh, but this is one of our interventions. And then the third stone that we have is inspired by one of my elders, Baba Curtis Muhammad. He was at our dinner table a few years ago with his like white afro and long white beard. He was wearing all white clothes because he was just back from Brazil and he was doing like the consomble thing. And he said, you know, Leah, what is your farm doing for civil rights? And I'm like, it's a farm. He was like, <laughs> he's like, you know that the farmers were the backbone of the civil rights movement. Like not metaphorically again. He said literally every meeting every meal, every pair of shoes that had to get fixed, everyone who had to get bailed out. It was the black farmer's land that provided safety and collateral. There would be no civil rights movement without landowning black farmers. And I was like, damn, that is really, really true. So he's like, you need to be organizing. You need to be doing what they were doing, as if we weren't already doing enough, right? So we're like, all right, we're going to do trainings. We're going to let people have meetings and retreats on our land. We're going to provide a safe space away from the police where we can really have these conversations outside of surveillance. So we, we do these on the farm and off the farm. We also started thinking about reparations, right, and, and worked on this reparations project where black and brown farmers put on this map, which you can see on our website, what kind of land they need, what resources they need to do their dreams. And then white folks or any folks with resources can go ahead and reach out to those people. And we have had three people get farms through this reparations map, which is super exciting. Because we need our lands, right? Without land, we have no freedom. We have no justice. We have no equality. 
And then, you know, you got to go to all these conferences and convenings and like move and shake and make things happen. Um, you know, and I used to kind of poo poo that stuff, but then I realized that, yeah, those high level conversations really do it. So uh, we work with the Heal Food Alliance and the Movement for Black Lives on these policy platforms, which are super exciting. And it's hard to move national policy, it really is. Um, but we did win in the last farm bill, like this tiny little thing, which was allowed farms to be able to um, accept EBT, which before you had to be a store or a farmer's market. So now CSAs actually can do that. So that was like our little win. But even more importantly, it's like when you organize with each other you build those relationships and those collaborations and things start to happen and this is not just domestically we're also working internationally um, in Haiti in Brazil in Ghana in um, Puerto Rico we have sister farms in all those places and it's whatever the community needs from us we're gonna try to leverage that resource and so like I go down to Haiti once or twice a year we've done I mean these farmers are so incredible so after like Hurricane Matthew swept through and literally flattened all of Leogan. Like there was, all the crops were wiped out. People's homes were down. I was like, what do you need? They're like, literally we just need an irrigation pump because then we can replant. I was like, an irrigation pump. That's literally what you want. I was like, okay, done. I raised like the $800 or whatever, went down there. As soon as I gave them the money, someone took a motorcycle to Port-au-Prince, brought back an irrigation pump, and within three days they had irrigated 20 farms like dug the trenches, you know, and irrigated 20 farms. That's what they do. Um, it's incredible. And, and I don't know if you all know the Haitian peasant movement who we work with, they won the Food Sovereignty Prize for the world a couple years ago for resisting Monsanto GMO seed and burned it at the port. <laughs> That's so dope. <laughs> I put this up just for laughs. So the other thing we were doing besides irrigating was, re you know, repairing homes. And everybody in the community want this Pepto-Bismol pink, which is like the most audacious color, but they can have what they want. But we convinced um, Madame Antoinette to let us put like a blue accent because <laughs> we wanted another color. Um, so in closing, I just want to respect time. Um, you know, we really want to talk about what we can do next to advance racial justice in the food system. So your exit ticket before you leave this room is you're going to have to tell, when I'm done talking, you're going to actually have to tell someone what you're going to do. But I'll give you a few ideas first before... Um, so you don't have to think of it all by yourself. And many of you are already doing it, right? So first is like, remember, just like we saw all through history, black and brown people have been, are, and will be leading the food sovereignty movement. Don't have to invent new things. We don't need any like, you know, colonialism in the nonprofit world of like swooping into communities and fixing things. These are just some of the organizations that are predominantly people of color, people of color led that are leading this work, right, that you can check out. And there's a fuller list on our website. Other things, and these are pictures of them just to put faces to name. We got Karen and Dennis and Katrina, Gail Myers, many, many hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people that are doing the work. You know Trina, right? <laughs> I told her she was on my slideshow. She was like, I hate you. <laughs> my slideshow. Also thinking about, so thinking about actually offering resources and time to those organizations. And so sometimes that could mean something as simple as childcare or fundraising. It's not always glamorous. It's not always like on the mic, but really figure out how to support those organizations. Getting educated and especially for white people, really talking to folks who don't already agree with you, right? We wouldn't have the president that we have if white people were talking to other white people who didn't agree with them and trying to move the conversation in the direction of justice and kindness and fairness. So we really gotta talk about that. Policies, we, we can't let them destroy SNAP. We cannot do the boxes thing that did not work on the reservations. It's not gonna work in other communities, right? So we gotta make sure we pay attention. And if your organization is not already food justice certified or doesn't participate in one of those good food purchasing programs, Go ahead and do that, right? Leverage a little bit of that, that power. So I'm now gonna ask two friends to come up here for a closing poem and help me read it. And it can be any two friends who want to. Come on up. One more friend. <laughs> so what we're gonna do this is a two-page poem. Um, we're each going to just read a line or a little section, and then we'll pass the mic to the next person until we read the whole thing. Sound good? OK. All right. You come on, friend. OK. Yes. How far should I go? Um, just the first line. See. See what can you do, what you can do. 
Oh, I forgot to say, we gotta read it like real dramatically. Oh, oh, see, see what you can do? Never mind you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind you born a slave. Never mind you lose your name. Never mind your daddy dead. Never mind nothing. Here, this here is what man can do if he puts his mind to it and his back in it. Stop sniveling, the land said. Stop picking around the edges of the world. Take advantage. And if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here on this planet, in this nation, in this country, right here, nowhere else. We got a home in this rock, don't you see? Nobody's starving in my home, nobody crying in my home. And if I got a home, you got one too. Grab it, grab this land. Take it, hold it, my brothers. Make it, my sisters, shake it, squeeze it. Turn it, twist it, beat it, kick it, kiss it, whip it, stomp it, dig it, plow it, seed it, reap it, rent it, buy it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass it on. Can you hear me? Pass it on. <laughs> Thank you so much. So it's like eight o'clock, so no sweat if you gotta go, but I'll maybe take like two questions or something and then, and then we'll call it. But you have to have an action step too. What? Oh yeah, I skipped that slide. Yes, yeah, so Farming While Black is Soul Fire Farm's definitive guide to decolonizing food, land, and agriculture. It's like everything from seed saving to growing food to finding land to the history, like all the stuff. It comes out in November from Chelsea Green. It should be like, yeah. check it out. <laughs> My manuscript's actually due on Tuesday. I'm so excited to print out that stack, like 500 page. Any questions? Ha, ha, ha. Um, two reasons. We could not afford land in central Massachusetts where I grew up. Secondly, we had children quite young and no one else had kids in our community and especially not mixed race kids. And in Albany, New York, there's a funky little democratic education community called the Free School that was the community we needed at that time to be the parents we wanted to be. So that's, that's why. Oh, that's a great, the question was like for white folks, how to educate yourself. Um, there's a really good website called white accomplices, like .org or .com that has some super basic stuff. But if you go on our website, on our media publications page, we have a bibliography of like more comprehensive resources. And if you can do a training with like Aorta or the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond or some of those organizations, it's good like baseline. But fundamentally, you know, really, I think if you always come back to like, what are people of color leading and asking for in the community, you really can't go wrong, so. One more, sure. Yeah, so folks are welcome. Every month we have a community volunteer day, potluck, tour, and so that's a good way for the first time to visit is to come out and I really, I love you all, you're amazing, so I really hope you bring like a whole van load of people um, <laughs> to the farm so we can hang out. And then we also have a bunch of other programs, but they're all on our website. You can see what would be a good fit. Well, thanks everyone, have a wonderful night. Appreciate it.